Good evening, YouTube. Um, this isn't usually what I do if I am going to record a video. Usually I would be sort of sat looking all, you know, like ready. But I don't know, inspiration just struck me this evening. It is a cozy, cozy, cozy fall, because we're in America, not autumn, fall night. And I really just felt like sharing some PhD advice with you guys. So let's get cozy and dive in. You can tell I'm from England because I love a builder's tea. I guess I was just kind of editing one of my last videos and inspiration really struck. So I felt like now is the right time to talk to you guys about how you can try to get more research experience and stand out on your applications. The reason I'm talking today about slightly out of the box ways of getting more research experience is because everyone has worked in a lab. Well, not everyone, we'll come to that in a different video. <laughs> but like in general, people are gonna have some kind of science experience. Whether you're a clinician or a pure scientist, you're gonna have some kind of research experience. It's kind of a given really when you apply. And as much as the admissions team do want to hear about that i don't know i think it's kind of fun to do something a little bit different like come up with something a bit, you know a little bit different like a little bit more out the box then people it'll stick with you as well they'll be like oh that was the weird girl that worked down at the pig farm or i don't know not pig farm but you, you know what i mean like something that's basically what i want to cover in this video let's get Started. My number one different thing is probably journals. Now, as an undergraduate, there were a couple of student journals around, floating around campus, and I got involved in setting one up and being a senior editor on one of the journal boards for a new journal. And this was an invaluable experience for me. I loved it. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it because it does give you a bit more of an overview of the publication process as a whole. I think oftentimes in science, we're sort of pigeonholed into churning out papers and doing research with the hope of getting some papers, getting your name out there. While writing papers is super important, it can be a little bit different to have a bit of experience in the publishing side of things by getting involved in these student journals. So going through the roles, obviously we've got a writer, you've got the editor that would kind of oversee everything and decide what articles are going in, what articles aren't going in. Essentially the editor would have the final say. Then you have the peer reviewing team. So the peer reviewers will meticulously read through your article that you've submitted, probably rip it to shreds. You probably will cry when you read their feedback, but the peer reviewing team is super, super important because it helps you make your paper better. And I know that a lot of us have probably received peer review feedback that's a bit savage, but how often have you been the peer reviewer? I think it's a great idea to sort of practice and get more experience at that skill because then you know what the peer reviewing team is looking for. And at the end of the day, that makes you a bit more of a well-rounded and better scientist. Um, so I definitely, definitely would say that getting involved in student journals or even bigger, I was going to say adult, <laughs> like adult proper like journals, you know, like real life ones, um, is definitely a good thing to do. I know that some journals do offer sort of internships and that kind of thing. So having a summer internship, getting involved in that side of the publication process can be something a little bit different. It's something that not everybody has, but it can really help you stand out on your application. Another task that I think is quite a good way of getting a little bit different experience experience is more desk-based data sorting tasks. Um, so really helping out with someone else's paper, maybe someone else you know, a lecturer or someone is writing a paper, being able to offer to help sort through their data, do some stats, do some bioinformatics. These are all desk-based things you can do without setting foot in a lab. So it would really allow you to balance your schoolwork with still getting that research experience. It's also not something that everybody will have if you're going for something like, if you're not going for a pure computational PhD degree, for example, people will talk about how they have spent a lot of time in the lab doing all these amazing experiments and yes you need to include that too but not a lot of people spend the time analyzing the data so being able to show and prove that you have these data analysis skills and you're able to hone them through doing pure data analysis tasks is something that I think would really really stand out so another thing that I would say is online certificates do not underestimate the power of a good stats 
certificate. How many people would go out of their way in their free time to learn how to code or learn stats? If you're not a pure statistician and that's not your jam and it's really, really, really not mine, then doing something and taking that time to learn the skill that you find difficult and getting a certificate in it is a really, really, really great way of showing that you're dedicated to expanding your knowledge base. And at the end of the day, data analysis is a huge part of writing a paper. The whole results section is data analysis. Like you're not gonna be able to conclude anything without doing some kind of stats, which is really, really sad, but it's true. So you really wanna make sure that you have these skills or if you don't have them, that you're willing to learn them because not everybody would. It's a lot of effort for a pretty boring topic if you find it boring. Sorry if you're any stats people out there. In general, that's what I think. Another thing that I also think is a great way of getting a bit more research experience is DIY research, literally doing it yourself. Now, I kind of split this for myself when I was applying into two facets. So DIY in terms of the actual research. So literally going out of your way to create your own research project. There is a lot that you can do if you're not in the lab. From personal experience, this is what I ended up having to do because I really could not for the life of me get into a lab. Everyone kept saying no. Um, I did vaguely cover this in my first YouTube video, but anyway, long story short, I ended up writing my own paper, my own literature review. So just some examples of things that you could do is a literature review, um, a meta-analysis, or if you're a vet or animal health professional, then a knowledge summary is a great way. Um, I'll drop a link in the description below for Veterinary Evidence, which is one of the leading publishers of knowledge summaries. It is really, really accessible and very um, straightforward, and they have some great templates on there that really introduce you to the world of doing a literature search, writing a literature review. So all of those things are definitely super, super valuable. And I would 10 out of 10 recommend if you are struggling to get research experience, just trying it yourself. There are a great few tutorials and things out there. So definitely give it a go. The other section would be the scientific communication section of DIY science and experience. So scientific communication, as I vaguely mentioned earlier, is a huge, huge, huge part of research. So we wanted to be able to disseminate our research in an accessible way. Um, so doing that yourself in terms of um, taking part in outreach events. Um, in the UK, there's something great called Pint of Science, where it's basically a pub night and you go and describe some cool research and science with uh, members of the public who might not have any science experience. So it is a great way of connecting with others and really getting your research out there. Um, if that's not really your thing, some other things you can do is um, starting a podcast. That was another thing I did um, where we sort of discussed research articles in a fun and accessible way. Um, just basically chatting about cool research and that was kind of fun to do. A YouTube channel, what we're doing here, trying to do here, or a blog, this kind of stuff. It really does kind of showcase your entrepreneurial ability, your ability to think creatively, ability to think out of the box, use your initiative and actually get out there and do something, you know? You're not waiting for stuff to fall on your plate, you're actually getting out there and improving your scientific communication by yourself. And if you build a following, then that's great. The application assessors are gonna really, really like that. So it is definitely something that I would look into. Another thing I would say when I was trying to get more research experience for application season is make use of your connections. If you haven't already, I would definitely recommend starting building a professional network through LinkedIn, basically. I started posting on LinkedIn about a year ago now and it has completely changed the way I view networking and changed my life in a non weird way. Um, LinkedIn has been incredible. I've met some great scientists um, and it's a really great way of supporting each other. It's also a great way to find ways of getting involved in different people's research and open up for worldwide collaborations. This is a topic that I'm super, super passionate about. I don't know if you can tell, but I will do a separate video on LinkedIn and how to harness that, especially as a graduate student. But in terms of for this video, I would say making use of your network. So reaching out to people on LinkedIn. If you don't have LinkedIn, even your friends, your lecturers, your clinician, they all do research as a part of their job. If there's a specific topic that you're interested in, email them. The power of the cold email, yes, you will get a lot of rejections, but sometimes you get a yes. So just not being afraid to reach out and really, really utilize the connections that you already have because you have way, way, way more than you think you do. So definitely make use of that. So there you have it. That was kind of a little quick whistle stop tour of a video, I feel. I feel like I got really quite into that and ended up speaking really quickly. So I'm sorry. I guess watch it back on half speed or something because I really, really raced through that. Um, but yeah, I hope that that was helpful. Those are sort of my top tips for getting a bit more out of the box research experience that you can add to your CV to sort of enhance, obviously, all the great and incredible science that you guys are all probably doing out there. Um, but it is just extra ways of really trying to stand out against the sort of swarm of people who have worked in a lab or been lab techs, you know? 
So it's just something a little bit different. I hope that that has helped. Um, again, if you have any questions or comments or other videos you want me to make, please drop them in the comments. I will hang around for sort of an hour after I upload this video to answer questions live. Yeah, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel if you like this video. If you like this content and you want to see more, then yeah, please do hit that subscribe button and I will see you guys next week. Bye.